You can take your Bibles and you can turn to Galatians 5. We're continuing where Pastor Pat left off. But we truly live in amazing times. Technology is advancing at light speeds. We really live with the world at our fingertips. We have instant answers and we have endless resources for everything that life throws at us. Fast, easy, and convenient. That's how we roll. That's how we like it. That's what we're comfortable with. You don't know something? Ask Siri or Alexa or Google. When in doubt, YouTube it. So naturally, because this is the context and the culture in which we live, we naturally approach the Christian life in a very similar way. We view our relationship with God in a very similar way. We want the Christian life for dummies version or manual at our disposal with the step-by-step -step tutorial, the quick fix, the easy button, the tips and tricks. We want the instant answer references all ready to go so that all we need to do is go back to what we favorited or bookmarked or liked. We liked the Holy Spirit on Facebook, so therefore life should be easy, right? That's how we approach this. Why do we want a formula or an equation for living by the Holy Spirit? The answer is we don't like the answer Scripture gives. We don't like to walk by faith. Let's be honest. Our desire is for sinless perfection. We absolutely hate failure. We hate our sin. We don't like failing. We don't like being told we can't do something. We don't like the struggle, the wrestling that's going on in our lives. And our idea of a solution is a clear step-by-step -step strategy that's predictable and repeatable, offering minimal effort and maximum impact. Did you catch that? This is our solution. If we would write the script, here's what we want to see happen. We want a very clear step-by-step -step strategy that's predictable and repeatable, offering minimal effort in maximum impact. That's what we want to see take place in our Christian life. We want the plan, and then we simply want to work the plan. Well, the emphasis in this text, Paul is reminding us of an often overlooked and misunderstood reality of the gospel. It's the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. Our passage this morning is Galatians 5, 16 through 26, and Paul is encouraging us with the solution for combating our fleshly appetites that wage war within us. And he does so without dismissing the struggle or the tension. He's not downplaying that. He's even acknowledging it in the text. What we're going to see in this passage is that he is arguing for us to live from our position, not for it. To live from our position in Christ by faith. Faith is an ongoing learning process, and it's opposed to our natural human tendencies. We want to control. We want to act. We want to do. We struggle to trust. Even as followers of Christ, what do we emphasize? We emphasize faith in our justification, but then when it comes to sanctification and just living out the Christian life, we actually undermine faith. Learning to live by faith in the Spirit is the freedom that Paul is talking about in this text, in this context. So let's learn to listen to the letter to the Galatians. I think there's a challenge for us in our culture and context. I've already referenced the technology and the convenience and the comfort and everything that's at our disposal. And so I think a challenge that we face in our culture and context is in the manner in which we approach the text. We don't sit down and read this letter on a Sunday morning in its entirety and then go about working through this. 
what we do is we take more manageable sections of Scripture and we work through it. In our media-saturated society and advanced technology, I think it's really a challenge for us to sit and pay attention to anything for longer than 30 seconds. And so that you keep coming back week after week to sit through a 30 to 40 minute message, I know it's challenging, I know it's trying, and it's just a testament to your faith. So what we try to do in safeguarding as we take this more manageable section of scripture, we try to protect and safeguard and work against isolating the passage and pulling it out of its context and just teaching whatever we think it says or want to say or the point that we want to drive home with it. We try to safeguard against that. And we try very, very hard to keep this in context. We do not want to isolate this section and make it say something that it doesn't say. And I believe the text at hand, Galatians 5, 16 through 26, is one of those texts that's often handled in isolation, and it's disconnected from the rest of the letter. And it's easily misunderstood, misused, and misapplied. I think Pastor Pat handled it phenomenally last week when he put this in its historical context. He took us back to Acts 13 through 15, and he hit the highlight reel of why was this letter written to these churches of Galatia? Multiple churches would have been receiving this letter. And multiple churches struggled with what Paul is addressing in this text. So if we're going to listen well to this portion of Scripture, we've got to keep in light the whole of the letter. And so we have to listen to the melody of the text, which I think Paul does in Galatians 1, verses 3 through 9. He lays out the thesis, the thing that anchors this whole argument together. His thesis is Galatians 1, 3 through 9, where he defends his argument in the following pages. So what's his thesis? It's the gospel. And listen to how he writes it. Listen to what Paul says. The gospel is Jesus, the one who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of the Father, the will of, of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he goes on in the next breath and says, don't desert Jesus. Don't distort this gospel. So the, the melody of this letter is Jesus came to deliver us. He's the deliverer, the rescuer from sin and slavery. And he came to rescue us from sin. Don't desert him. Don't distort this good message of the gospel. And our text this morning highlights how we might distort the gospel by adding to it, by refusing to live by faith. But then let's, let's listen to the literary context. I know Pastor Pat took us to the historical context, but let's be reminded of where we've been so far in this as Paul's been unpacking his argument. In chapter 4, he ends with an illustration, and he uses several, several different aspects to, to ultimately say, you are free. You are no longer living as slaves. Christ has rescued us from living under the bondage and slavery of the law. The law could not do for you what you were looking for it to do. It could not give you life. It could not make you righteous. It could not make you right with God or acceptable or pleasing. And so Jesus came, and he rescued you from the slavery of the law. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul has the audacity to put it in writing to remind them of these things that they should already know. And he tells them that Christ has rescued you to live in freedom. So stand firm in that freedom. Hold your ground. Refuse to go back to a lifestyle of slavery. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I don't know about you, but I have never seen a movie where a people group 
or a person struggled desperately trying to escape from freedom to slavery. If you can think of a movie like that, please let me know. It'd be an interesting plot line. I've never heard of war breaking out because a people group was revolting against freedom. They just couldn't help it and they wanted to be slaves. We don't see movies written like that. We don't see that portrayed in anything. That would put a whole new twist on Mel Gibson's role in Braveheart. They may take our lives, but they will never take our slavery. Just, I mean, you can't rally an army with that. You can't rally a nation, a country, a people with that. And Paul is, is saying, why in the world? It, I mean, it even sounds crazy for me to say this out loud. Don't go back to slavery. And that's what Paul's doing. He's having to tell a people group who's been liberated, who's been rescued, who's been freed to not go back to slavery. That's a head scratcher. But it's our human tendency. It's our natural human default. And I'm going to see this on display in this text. But in Galatians 5.1 and Galatians 5.13, Paul reminds these churches that Jesus has set us free to experience the joy of this freedom. He's not rescued us from slavery to keep living like slaves. So throughout this letter, Paul clearly is arguing that if in any way that we're looking to the law to either justify us, declare us righteous, or sanctify us, keep us righteous, then we've gone back to bondage and slavery. Now our tendency, just from a human perspective, is to narrowly think about this idea of slavery. And we think of it as purely just succumbing to the appetites of the flesh. The flesh, our natural human desires. That's what we often think of this as slavery, is, oh, we don't want to go back to satisfying those appetites and living in sin. However, the slavery that Paul is primarily addressing throughout this letter to these churches is our human tendency to curb or combat the flesh by following the law. Did you hear that? What he's been doing all throughout this letter, this church is not wrapped up in this gross immorality in this sin that we, we think and we see going on in Corinth. The tendency for them, the struggle for them to live by the flesh was to curb or combat the flesh by following the law or to look to the law to secure their righteousness. That's what's going on. And so throughout this letter, Paul uses graphic and caustic language to help the church see just how serious this is. Just how important this is. He wants them to see the heresy that's infiltrating the church. They were called to freedom. And they were to be living, celebrating, and enjoying this freedom. Not abusing it. And that's the, the portion just before the text that Mike read for us that Pastor Pat looked at last week. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Freedom should not be leveraged as an opportunity for the flesh. But what does that mean? It shouldn't be used as an opportunity to indulge sin. Sinful indulgence is not why we've been rescued. But equally true is leveraging the law to try to secure righteousness. That, too, is an opportunity for the flesh. That is the main struggle that's taking place in these churches of Galatia. These churches can look like this church. They probably have the same desires that we have to know God, to, be, to live pleasing to him, to love one another, to live righteous, to live holy, to be kind, 
and gentle and patient. I believe they genuinely desired these things, but how did they go about it? They looked to the wrong solution for this. That's what I see taking place in this. Us taking this opportunity for the flesh looks like either indulging sin or trying to leverage law to produce righteousness. Both is an opportunity for the flesh. This, what we really desire, is what this text has a solution for us. We want to know what it's like to live life in the Spirit and to live loving one another. Well, this flows from the Spirit, and it will produce these things that we actually desire. And so let's take a closer look at this text and learn to live in the freedom of the gospel. Learning to do this, though, learning to live in the freedom of the gospel is a lifelong adventure. And it's an adventure that's marked by faith. In these verses, 16 through 26, Paul is really, there's one main point here. And we're going to break this down and look at it from a few different angles, and we'll just unpack it verse by verse. But in verse 16, we see the consequence or the result of freedom. Verse 16, Paul says, I say, walk or live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul encourages the churches of Galatia. This is a, a word of encouragement, of exhortation. It is a command. It's an imperative. He is telling them to live from their position. Live by the Spirit. Christ has rescued you. It's still in this context of, of chapter 5 and through this whole letter. Christ has rescued you for freedom. You are in Christ. You belong to him. And now he says it in just a slightly different way. Live by the Spirit. He's very concerned about them deserting the gospel or distorting the gospel because that's what's infiltrating the church. And he reminds them to live from their position, from their identity in Christ. He says it in chapter 4. He says the same thing in a slightly different way. Listen to what he says in chapter 4 in verses 1 through 7. You've been adopted as sons and daughters and given the Spirit. So live as heirs not slaves. Here in our text this morning, Paul is emphasizing the reality of the Spirit's role. And these are our working synonyms. In Christ, in the Spirit. And both speak to identity. They're communicating the same thing. So the result or consequence of living from our position is that we now have freedom, we now have power, we now have the ability to say no to our natural human desires and appetites. That's what verse 16 says. Because of our position in Christ, you can say no to the flesh. We have that ability. You know, Paul speaks of this in Romans 6 as well. So if you want further study, he speaks of this in more detail you can go and look at that, but we are free to not indulge the desires of the flesh because of Christ. What a blessing. What a freedom. What a privilege that is ours. And Paul is reminding this church that this is their freedom and the ability that they have now in the Spirit. But there's a conflict. And we can all resonate with the conflict of freedom. And we see that on display in verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We can all resonate with the struggle described in this verse, can't we? We can all resonate with the ongoing tension. Life on the horizontal is painful and problematic. There's turmoil there's tension, there's struggle. And I think what's cool about this is Paul doesn't dismiss the struggle. He doesn't dismiss the tension. He hits it head on. 
But his answer and solution for this is often different, or it's different than ours. We often approach it in a different way. But Paul clearly says that this is a war zone. We have conflicting desires vying for control of us. We have the indwelling spirit. We have our new nature that opposes the flesh, our old nature. And what do we desperately want? We want to be done with failure. We want to be done with sin. We want to be able to flip the switch or plug in the right formula or code and always live righteous, holy. We don't ever want to struggle. That's coming one day. One day we will be glorified and the sin struggle will be done. But until then, life on the horizontal, it's not fun. It's painful. And we wrestle with that on various levels and to various degrees. It's a lifelong journey for us then to learn to live in the freedom that is ours to learn to live from our new identity in Christ. It's a lifelong process of enjoying what God is doing in us and through us. Paul uses similar language to talk about this struggle in Romans 6 and 7. We don't have time to go there, but he does this in more detail. But I think it's interesting at the end of verse 17, he says that this opposition, this struggle, this conflict, this war that's going on inside of us, what happens with this whole thing? These are opposed to each other, the flesh and the spirit, and what happens? They keep us from doing what we want to do, right? We have these competing desires, these conflicting desires. Think about it for a moment. What do you want to do? What desires, what longings do you have that are clearly from the indwelling spirit within you? You want to love. You want to say no to sin. You want to demonstrate kindness. You always want to respond with the right attitude. You hate it when you blow it. That's from the spirit. What are the desires and longings that we have that are clearly from the flesh. We could be honest and, and graphic and open about these, right? But these things are going on inside of us. And the only reason that there's tension at this point is because you've been given the Spirit. If you didn't have the Spirit, you wouldn't care. There wouldn't be a tension. There wouldn't be a war. You'd just live life but you struggle with this because you have the Spirit and now you care. Apart from the Spirit's presence, there's no conflict. But what he does in verse 18 is he's clarifying our freedom. He's building off of verse 16 and really the whole argument that he's been engaging with up to this point. He's previously just encouraged us to live from our position in verse 16 to live in the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, because that's our identity. And now he clarifies this. In verse 18, he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. This word if has been unfortunately translated in our English, English versions as if. This conditional subordinate um, would much better be translated either since or because. Now the translators have to make a choice. They chose if. I think they're wrong. Um, because the whole context and the construct of this letter shapes out this way, and he's dealing with position here. And it would much better be read, because you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's been Paul's argument this whole point in time. It's not... If you follow the Spirit, if you don't, he's not saying that. He's saying because, because you are led, that led is a passive indicative, you are led by the Spirit, and the Spirit is not leading you to live under law. He's not. Otherwise, what in the world did Jesus come to do? He came to rescue us from this law, and we'll get to that. 
in just a little bit. But Paul's argument here has not changed. Paul's argument's only heightened. You're only not under the law because you are in the Spirit, because you belong to Christ. So his answer is not try harder, do better, look to the law. Stop looking to the law to answer the tension of verse 17. That goes counter to our desires. That goes counter to what I want as a, as a human being because I want to bring something to this equation. I want to prove my worth. I want to live righteous and holy and honorable, and I want to do it and show God that it can be done now. I'll give a nod to the Spirit, but I want to bring something to this equation. And Paul's saying, no, you're in the Spirit. You don't have to say yes to the flesh. I recognize that there's this tension, there's this war, there's this conflict going on inside of you, but because you are led by the Spirit, you don't have to live under the law any longer. And then in verses 19 through 23, we see this controversy being played out in real time. The controversy in this text is directly connected to the tension we see on display in 17, the war that's going on. And in verses 19 through 21, Paul's giving a nod to the works of the flesh. Listen to what he says. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. We're like, yeah, no, no doubt, Paul. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul gives a nod to these works of the flesh, and he says, man, this list is representative, mind you. It's not exhaustive. Okay, he says, and things like these, okay, he could go on and on and on and on, right? We're really good at being creative and making up sin, but these are representative, not exhaustive. They deal with everything, and we can obviously and easily put these in the category of the flesh. Paul says, yeah, it's evident. I don't even have to tell you about this. And that's why the thrust of this letter has not been to deal with these. This is the first time he's really mentioning these types of things. And this list of the flesh isn't even the point or focus of this text. He's saying, yeah, that's, that's obvious. You know this. But the, the not-so-recognizable works of the flesh, the not-so-recognizable natural human tendency and desire for us is to leverage law to combat this list. It's our desire to leverage law to try to resist the flesh, this whole list, and to try to leverage law to live righteously. That's the error that the Galatian churches were, were dealing with. It wasn't wallowing in the works of the flesh that Paul just lists. It's rather the not-so-evident drive to live under law and safeguard against the flesh or to somehow manufacture or produce a holiness or righteousness. That's what's taking place in this text. I think at this point, too, it's really interesting to see what Paul says next and to see what he doesn't say in this text. He's just given a nod to the works of the flesh, and in his next breath, we would expect him to say, now the corrective to the works of the flesh is follow the law. Is that what he says? No. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. The counter to the flesh is to shine a spotlight on the Holy Spirit and the fruit that he produces in the lives of believers. 
That's what Paul does here in this text. Unfortunately, we have misunderstood and we have misapplied this text within mainstream evangelicalism, I think, for a long time. We look at the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, and what we do is we create two lists, one to avoid and one to accomplish. That's how we use this text. Okay, I got to do really hard, and I'm going to set up all these safeguards and all these protectives, and I'm going to tick all these boxes to do everything to, to beat the flesh down. And then on the other hand, I'm going to try really hard to love and be good and kind and patient. And who are we focusing on when we do this? Where's our dependence? We try to measure and gauge and strategize and plan and protect and accomplish. And we have no idea that this text is calling us to live in faith dependent on the Holy Spirit. And what we're trying so aggressively to do He's doing in and through us to those around us. We want a formula for safeguarding against the flesh, and we want a formula for pursuing these desirable fruits of the Spirit. And what's our formula? Leverage law. What does Paul say in Colossians about this? In Colossians 2, 16 through 23, he says, that sounds really nice. It looks good on paper. It gives an appearance of wisdom. But guess what it can't do? It can't stop the indulgence of the flesh. Law adherence never does that. Only faith accomplishes this. We don't look to our performance. We look to the performance of another. And he's given us his spirit. And we don't know what to do with that. Because it's not safe. It's not controllable. It's not uh, a formula that is, you know, something that we can figure out and solve and plug and play and go to our favorites and pull it out. It's something that we have to live depending, trusting. The very emphasis of this entire letter is undermined when conformity to law is our takeaway. Sadly, we actually pull this text out and try to leverage it in such a way that cleans up our life without dependence on the Spirit, and we actually commit the very heresy and buy into the error that the Galatian churches were buying into. And we use this text to justify it. And it's really unfortunate. Paul brings his argument to a close in verses 24 through 26. Listen to what he says. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, here's the reality, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If or since, because, same as 18, because we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul concludes with reminding these believers that they've been crucified with Christ. What does this sound like? Are there warning signs going off in your mind? Is there another passage that reminds us of that? Again, if we would have read this letter in its entirety, you would have connected these dots so quickly. But he's echoing what he already said in chapter 2. Flip over to chapter 2 in verses 15 through 21. He's saying the same thing. We're justified by faith, not by works of the law. That's verse 16. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And then you jump down to verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We've got a choice here to learn to live by faith or to resort to what can I do to secure or maintain? Keep reading. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, 
then Christ died for no purpose. And Paul continues to call us to live in the freedom that's ours, to live by faith, to live dependent on the Holy Spirit, to trust Him. Because we live by the Spirit, he says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is done by faith. He will produce the right practice in us. He will produce the fruit in us that we desperately long for. I believe wholeheartedly that the churches in Galatia longed for love, joy, peace, this list here but how they went about it was erroneous. I think we have the same desire. How are we going about it? If we look to law to conform us to Christ or to combat the flesh, then actually the opposite of what we're looking for is going to take place. We'll become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another rather than loving one another. Look back up to what Pastor Pat just looked at. He says, don't, in verses 13 through 15, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but instead, through love, serve one another. If we leverage law to try to do this, the opposite is what's going to happen because we're going to start measuring one another, comparing one another, and look at the results of this stuff in verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. If we don't trust the Spirit, but we try to do it in our own strength, this is what's going to happen, the very opposite of what we're looking for. In verse 26, he says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So let's connect the dots. Let's follow Paul's logic throughout this. Because he says in verse 25, because we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What is he talking about here? If you go back to chapter 2, in verse 5, in this context, there were false brothers who were trying to get them to conform to the law. Paul uses circumcision as representative for the whole law throughout Galatians. And he says, we didn't yield to these false brothers for a moment. Why? So that the, the truth of the gospel would be preserved for these churches the truth of the gospel. And that's why he confronts Peter in chapter 2, verse 14. Why? Because Peter's conduct. His orthopraxy was not in line with his orthodoxy. His conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's what verse 14 says. Same language, same, this is what Paul's doing. The gospel is too important. And so I had to confront Peter because it's impacting the church. And Peter wasn't living from his position. It wasn't in step with the truth of the gospel. Now, did that mean Peter wasn't saved? No. Was Peter not filled with the Spirit? No. Was Peter not led by the Spirit? That's not what he's saying. He's just saying that he wasn't living from his position. And what was the corrective for Peter? Go back to the gospel. Be reminded of the truth of the gospel. Jesus is enough. We don't need more. And then we jump back to chapter 5. And he says to these churches, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? That obeying is believing. We try to make it this list of works. It's not. Who hindered you from believing this? And belief always, always culminates in works and response. And it happens that way, not the other way around. And so Paul is driving home the point that they needed to learn to depend on, lean on the Spirit by faith, that they're not under the law. But when they actually learn to trust the Spirit, they're going to live out the law's intent because it's the Spirit who's going to produce love in them. It's nothing that I can manufacture or produce or make into a checklist because when are you going to be loving enough, gentle enough, patient enough, But this is something that the Spirit is doing in us and through us. Because they have the Spirit, Paul is saying, they must learn to trust the Spirit by faith. Because we have the Spirit, learn to depend on the Spirit. Trust the Spirit by faith. As we wrap up, what does this look like practically? What's our takeaway? 
Well, you can see in your bulletin, there's just three things to remind us of, is to learn to live from your position in Christ, not for it. To learn to live from your position in Christ, not for it. Number two, learn to trust the Spirit to produce the fruit in your life rather than making it something that you try to manufacture. This is difficult for us because, like I said earlier, we want to bring something to the table. That is our human default. We want to secure. We want to produce. And thirdly, learn to live by faith in the Spirit by refusing the strong pull to live under law. Our natural human desire is to gravitate to live in this bondage. Because if you, if you would say, okay, just give me something tangible from this text that I need to do, this text is telling you to stop it. Stop trying to do it in your strength. Stop looking to law to accomplish what only the Spirit can do. It takes faith to resist the pull and appeal of living under law. It takes faith to live from your position rather than for it. It takes faith to believe that the Spirit is producing love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control in you. It takes faith, especially when we don't see it the way we want to see it. And in there lies the problem. We don't feel it the way we want to feel it. And so, obviously, the Spirit's not working is what we think. It takes faith to believe that the indwelling Spirit is more capable, more powerful, more intentional than your efforts to conform to the law. That's what he's saying in this text. Learn to live in the freedom of walking in the Spirit, of life in the Spirit. That's this text. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is a joy to gather in this place as your people to hear your words. We trust that your spirit is taking your word and doing the work in us. And if we're honest, it is difficult for us to walk by faith because we want a tangible God, a God that we can see. We want a God that we can um, wrap our, our mind around theologically and, and put in a nice grid and systematize so that we can you know, pull you out and work this formula and plug and play in everyday life. And it is really difficult for us to walk by faith because we're visual people. We're tangible people. We're a do-it people. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us that you are sufficient for these things that it is only Jesus' performance that we're looking to. Thank you for your indwelling spirit. Lord, help us to understand the work that he is doing in us and through us to those around us so that you get all the glory. In Christ's name, amen.